And my name is Sabrina, and uh, Leanne did a lovely job, very informative. I learned a couple new things. <laughs> um, just a quick intro into who I am. I have an MS in publishing from NYU. My undergrad was at UCSB, right around here, so go Gaucho, have to do that. Um, also, don't go there tonight because it's Halloween. <laughs> Uh, I was an ebook developer when I was living in New York, and I worked for a number of companies, including some of the big five, Simon & Schuster, one. Um, I also, but, uh, so right now, I do a bunch of things. For example, my blog, Digital Pubbing, which has a bunch of updates on self-publishing things. I do have a full-time day job, so I just wanted to, it's in a, a tech company in the Bay Area, so a little bit different, but I thought it was important to know, like, you can do these things outside of work, outside of your busy schedule, just keep it a little bit at a time, you can get a lot done. So, um, for example, I also publish books. I have uh, number seven, should be coming out in a couple months once I get some time to edit it, or it's gone through an editor, it needs to be revised. I also uh, have my own websites. I teach an online course on how to create ebooks. This is something I wanted to do to share uh, kind of a, for beginners, people how to make their own ebooks so that you can save a little bit of money because how you format an ebook can make a big difference. My husband and I also do a dinosaur podcast. We are. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, wedding ring is a dinosaur fossil. We. <laughs> We're dinosaur enthusiasts, so expect to see some dinosaurs appearing throughout this presentation. <laughs> so, just a quick breakdown of what we're going over. And again, this these slides are available online on SlideShare. I believe uh, Kathleen has a handout I think, um, that you can access online, and it's got a link to this slideshow. Uh, I have a number of resources to be going over. There's a lot of links. Don't worry about writing them down. This can access them online. Uh, also, I have an appendix section in here so that if you want to see more links, because I thought the slides looked a little too daunting otherwise. Um, so yeah. So for writing and editing, I know a lot of you have already written a manuscript, you're in the process of writing a manuscript, but just kind of for future, these are some cool tools that can help you collaborate with other authors or even editors. One I want to point out in particular is Poetica. It's this beautiful um, app, also plugged in on WordPress now, where it's this team that decided that like track changes on Word were too impersonal. So they made a way to make it look, uh, to translate digitally how an editor would write their notes online. It's beautiful and it just seems to be more intuitive. Now some distraction-free writing platforms. Uh, if you're anything like me, and I know a lot of you are on social media, sometimes a blank page or even maybe being stuck in the middle of a chapter feels really daunting. And then I think, oh, what's so-and-so doing on Facebook? This will only take a minute. <laughs> and then uh, an hour goes by and it's like, what happened? I got nothing done. So here's a list of uh, platforms that will not let you access anything but your writing. <laughs> One I want to point out, this, it's a little bit different at the bottom, is Screener. That's actually a piece of software you can buy for $45. And I really like Screener because it, you can include all your research notes into one document along with the draft you're working on. So I use it a lot for my first draft. I tend to do a lot of research. You got to do a lot of research for dinosaur books, for example, and keeping it all in one place and being able to go back and forth is really handy. Beta readers. Leanne went over this a little bit weird. Of course, have to have some cats. Uh, <laughs> so, professional editors, I think, are incredibly important. But before going to that step, sometimes it's handy to have a beta reader. Beta readers, they can start off as family and friends. They can be people that you find anywhere that you're willing. So, for example, I found a number of beta readers for some of my books who uh, people who subscribe to my blog and then they email me some questions or something and it's related to a book I'm working on and I say, hey, would you be interested in looking at this draft? And they're really helpful. They can do a whole wide range of things. They can, uh, sometimes they'll, it'll be as simple as some proofreading or sometimes it's as big as finding plot holes. So uh, it's, it's really great when you're able to make those connections too because it's, just, it's good in general to make as many connections as you can. 
These are a couple additional fun tools. I like Grammarly and the Hemingway app because they can spot some spelling and grammatical errors in a way a little bit better than Word, I've found. It seems to be a little bit more intuitive. This one is a, web, a fun website. Language is a virus. It's, if you have writer's block, they have a lot of creative writing prompts. And they also have this fun um, random text generator for haikus, so that could be fun for some inspiration. <laughs> Historical thesaurus. This one is really cool. It's a uh, University of Glasgow put together 800,000 words, give or take, and they trace down the origin and the meaning of the words that change throughout time. So that's a good resource and could be a little bit fun. Maybe you want to block that when you're in a distraction. Mm -hmm. Writing. When you're ready to start <laughs> So, uh, book covers, and Leanne covered this in depth, I agree, they should be professional. For ebooks especially, keep in mind that they need to look good as a thumbnail. If a reader is browsing on Amazon, for example, your cover is going to be tiny, and it needs to be legible and stand out and still look attractive. Uh, one great thing about ebooks, though, is that you can always change it, so it's something you can experiment with. There's a number of ways to design your book cover. No matter what you do, though, keep in mind you need to have a plan in advance, have a budget, have a timeline. Know that no matter what, you're going to go through a few rounds of edits. It's not going to be what you're looking for from the beginning. Uh, if you want to hire a designer, I suggest having a contract with them. And uh, Creative Indie, which is this bit.ly link here, uh, has a sample contract you can use as a template or a start. You can also buy a pre-made design or crowdsource. We'll go over more of that in a minute. You can also potentially make your own design using tools like Photoshop or Kindle Cover Creator. You can get images uh, by them as stock images or from public domain. Um, and the one thing you want to keep in mind is fonts, and the book designer has a great link of, they recommend five <coughs> fonts that are great for book covers, the pajamas. So these are the seven book covers I have. These two, I, uh, they're children's books, and I was working with a couple different illustrators through uh, Fiverr, the website. And then for these covers, uh, they made a couple images that I liked, and I turned it into a cover. This one is from a site called Self Pub Book Covers, which they have a bunch of unique designs. And once you choose and buy a design, they'll take it off the website so no one else can use it. And they're also willing to work with you. I made a, I asked for a couple little tweaks on this one, so they're willing to make changes for you. Uh, crowdsourcing. I did these through 99 Designs get into that in the next slide. These two I made myself using stock images. However, I did a lot of polling, friends, family, people online, and made a lot of changes throughout the process, made sure, okay, does this look good to you? What do you think? Things like that. <laughs> uh, if you want to hire designers, I have more links in the appendix. Here's just a short list where you can start. So now, crowdsourcing. I personally like the site 99designs use it twice so far. Uh, it's a community of designers. They do logos and other things in addition to book covers, but there's a number who do specialize in book covers. And what you do is you can select a package to have a contest online. The package I chose was the bronze package, the cheapest one, $2.99, which was pricey for me. But my justification was, well, I'm going to create a series out of these books. So if I have one design to start with, then I can sort of slightly tweak them for each book subsequent book, so it seemed like a better deal. Um, once I launched the contest, I personally reached out to a bunch of designers. I looked on the website for the work, and if I liked it, I said, hey, would you be interested in being a part of my contest? And I got a lot of great designers that way. Um, while you're going through the contest, it can feel very rushed and stressful. You have maybe seven <coughs> days or less if you're in a hurry and you want to pay a little bit extra. Give a lot of feedback right away to the designers so that they know what you're looking for because they're, they're allowed to submit as many designs as they want. And then in the end, you can choose a winner. So here's an example for my book, How to Create an eBook. These are some of the designs I got throughout the contest. So this is, again, for the first contest. As you can see, the old cover, uh, I made that. I didn't do polling, so it looks not great. I got one reader who emailed me and said, why does your cover look so perfunctory? And I thought, oh no, I need to make some changes. So when I went through 99 Designs, the winning design, you can see here, uh, was made by a talented designer named Arbor. 
However, there was this little green robot in the cover that I thought, well, that doesn't really make sense for this series. So I asked my designer to make a few changes, and this is the final design. And uh, you can see it, it's out in the bookstore. So aside from cover and writing and editing and stuff, um, production is a big part of the publishing process. For me, as a native book developer, there's a number of ways you can do this yourself. For example, you can take a Word doc and go through Smashwords and use this tool called Comic Writer, which is, I'm not a fan of that name, but it does its job. It does an okay job. There are a couple of quirks. I have seen some decent ebooks come from the Meat Writer, and I have seen some people who didn't really check their Word docs. And sometimes it comes out with weird fonts and different sized fonts, like one paragraph was much smaller than the next paragraph. I had one book I was reviewing and an entire chapter had a yellow background. And I thought, how did you not notice this before sending out your book for reviews? <laughs> but, um, so as an ebook developer, I am a little bit pickier about how my ebooks look. I like to have more creative control. And I found that you, you can make an ebook using a few free tools. You just need to know some basic HTML and CSS. It is totally possible to learn, but it is time consuming, can be frustrating in the beginning. So I created my Udemy course, How to Create Beautiful Ebooks. And in it, I go through it step by step with videos and sample templates that you can use to make your own ebooks. It is normally $47, but if, since you're attending this conference, uh, and this is in the handout, the link, I am offering it at a discounted rate of $7. Uh, you get, in addition to the videos, a copy of the ebook version of How to Create an Ebook, which has a few extra links and videos, as well as over 300 resources for self publishing that just kind of accumulated over the years. Where is the handout? That is online, right? What? The PDF handout? Yeah, they'll be online. Okay. You'll be getting links to all of them. Good. Yes. So, um, Wow. Once you have had your ebook made, this is, uh, you want to think about where am I going to sell it? And this is a very handy chart that came out earlier this month from Good Eat Reader. So you might think, Amazon, that's a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not the only game in town. There's a number of authors doing really well on Apple iBooks, Nook, Kobo. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, um, where do you want your reach to be? So if you want a more global reach, think about Amazon is in 13 countries, but Apple's in 51, Kobo's in over 160, so it's good to diversify. Before even starting to upload all your ebook stuff and cover and get it ready to sell, I would suggest getting your metadata together. This will save you so much time and then you won't be going crazy because then you can just copy and paste everything that you need. A couple things that you would want to start is a book description, a title, a subtitle if you have one, also uh, categories and keywords, and I believe Penny will go over it in great detail about this, and she's got some amazing resources. Um, metadata is just a term for like the book description is a piece of metadata. Metadata is data about your book. Yeah. So on Kindle, for an indie author, you would want to sign up through Kindle Direct Publishing, and that's really easy. You only have to fill out two pages of information. There's a couple interesting marketing options that you have. There's a thing called KDP Select, where you are exclusive to selling on Kindle for 90 days at a time. And in exchange for that exclusivity, you have a few different marketing options, such as freebie days. You have five days you can promote your book for free. Or Kindle Countdown, which is like a sales technique. You have a lower price on day one, and it slowly goes up throughout five days until you reach the normal price. Uh, you also are automatically enrolled into Kindle Unlimited, which is their new ebook subscription service. <coughs> if you ch whether or not you choose to be in KDP Select, you can do things like Kindle Matchbook, which is if you have a print version of your book, I think it may have to be create space though, you can offer a discounted version of your ebook. Uh, so I promised you some dinosaurs. Here's an example. Uh, one cool thing you can do with Kindle is you can kind of spice up your sales page a little bit using some basic HTML tags. And there is a link here that tells you which tags to use. And I have an example here of part of my uh, book description for the top 10 dinosaurs of 2014. 
the M tags means that the thing, the words inside those tags are going to be italics. Um, strong means they're bold, and then the ULI is a list, so you can see what it looks like on the sales page. We have we mentioned this a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of successful authors on Kindle. One of the recent ones is Andy Weir, and interesting backstory. He wrote The Martian back in 2009, and he had some trouble finding an agent, I think, for earlier work. So he decided, I'm going to publish one chapter at a time on my website for free. And readers loved it so much, they said, where is the ebook? And he said, fine, I'll put it up on Kindle. And he sold it for 99 cents, and sold, I believe, 35,000 copies in three months. And in January 2013, an audiobook publisher picked up the rights for the audiobook. Then Crown picked up the print rights in March 2013, and then of course, you know, the movie came out this month. Uh, so Apple iBooks again is in 51 countries. Great thing about Apple now is that you can read an ebook on any iOS device, iPad, iPhone, your MacBook, uh, which has kind of broadened their reach. They have a number of merchandising things, for example, you can kind of see here this buzzed about. Um, they do email promotions, social media stuff. You can't directly submit to Apple to say, hey, I'm on my book, but the editorial team is actively looking. This is based on trends, ratings, your platform, if they like your cover. They also get recommendations from platforms like Smashwords to share sales data every week. Uh, as an author, you can sign up to be an Apple affiliate, and then you can promote your books through the iBook store using widgets and links. So this is what it looks like if you're distributing on iBook by yourself. You do have to have a Mac. This is so that you can sign up for something called iTunes Connect and download an app called iTunes Producer. But the good news is once you do that, it's three little tabs, details about your book, the price, and then the file itself. For Nook, indie authors want to use Nook Press. And you can see here it's pretty straightforward, adding all your book's information. Yes. Have you ever used Draft? I've not, but I've heard good things. They're similar to Smashwords. Uh, they are. Uh, I used to use them for all of our books, and we went to the select uh, last month in a while and we will go back. But they're an aggregator that will upload to all these stores for you, uh, so you don't have to have a Mac or Tangle to go into iBook. <laughs> you know, you've got the digital, you know, the same metadata, and it puts it across all platforms, except for Kindle, you have to upload yeah. things. Yeah, that's the same with Smashwords, too. Have, uh, partnership. It doesn't cost anything. I think they take a quarter percentage of your book. It's not very much. Um, okay. So there is a, a minor fee, um, but you won't be able to, quite frankly. Uh, and uh, it, it does make things simpler instead of trying to go to every single website. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, but if you do want to go to a website way, it's, it's a little bit more time consuming, but I kind of like knowing how to do it myself. Uh, Kobo has a Kobo Writing Life, which is really, it's probably just one of the slickest platforms. And a cool thing about Kobo, this applies to a couple others too, you can do a pre-order option, set uh, a date in the future for when your book will be released, and then you can build a marketing plan around that. Amazon do that also. Mm -hmm. uh, so Google Play, this one, I think right now you can't sign up if you're new. I know they shut it down for a little bit because of some piracy issues, and when I checked a couple days ago, you still couldn't. But if you have somehow already signed up for Google Play, then it's pretty a uh, straightforward platform to submit your books. So Smashwords, I'm much more familiar with Smashwords than draft to digital uh, but it's kind of similar. It's a retailer and a distributor, so they have their own site where they sell the books, and then you can also upload your ebook and all the information all in one place, and then choose where you want to send out your books, everywhere but Kindle right now. So I was you no know, Kobo, all those things. Again, then you won't need a Mac. Um, I like to do it myself, though. I just like knowing how to do these things. You do save a little bit, because Smashwords does have to make a living with a little bit of royalty. <laughs> Um, so I use it for places that are a little bit harder to get to. Libraries. This is a really interesting one. Uh, I think it's pretty new this year. Until this year, it wasn't very easy for indie authors to get ebooks into libraries. So there is Selfie. This one is, might be more of a marketing tool for indie authors because it's uh, 
free to get to use, but you also don't earn anything for your ebooks that get into libraries. Ebooks are forever. This is a new platform. It's actually, I think it's coming out of beta soon. And this was meant to be a library acquisitions platform, which means that authors sell their books there and you get 70% of the royalties. So audiobooks. Uh, Leanne talked a little bit about audiobooks. Uh, again, ACFs, so that's the main platform where you can connect with narrators and other people in publishing. There's also a CD Baby, which is a little bit smaller platform, but you can have a little more flexibility with how you price your audiobooks. Um, I, have, I wrote an in-depth mini guide about how to produce and sell your audiobooks, and so if you are interested in learning more, you can get a free copy of that by signing up for my newsletter. So I just want to talk a little bit about Audible specifically. I have a friend who works in Audible's business development. So he gave some advice for indie authors. And it turns out Audible occasionally signs indie authors, which is cool. Um, they look at every title submitted through ACX. So when you're going through ACX, you want to make sure that, of course, the content is professional, the audio quality is high. Uh, you also want to go in thinking about the market. Uh, how could Audible potentially market your book? What could it tie into? Make sure you have lots of reviews. Um, figure out ways to help them out. And so you can submit online, but they also, um, which I was surprised, my friend told me, that they network a lot. They're business affairs group. They go to book fairs. They talk to a lot of agents. So keep an eye out for them at conferences or possibly online. Print on demand. Leanne also talked a little bit about this. I like print on demand because I don't have to worry about inventory. If I see a typo or want to change the cover, it's pretty straightforward for me to do so. So there's a number of places that you can go. So next, I want to talk about marketing. And for marketing, it's really important now that you have an online presence. Um, you want to build your audience, and this can be through a number of ways, your author website or blog, for example. I use WordPress. I love WordPress because it's free. Uh, if there's something that I want to do that's uh, hard for me to figure out, there's a huge community of people online willing to help. You can even hire people if you want to. Uh, for the blog, I like having a blog because it establishes for me a writing routine. I publish twice a week. Uh, and if you have enough content, you can eventually turn that into a book. Uh, email newsletter, and also went over this, uh, it's good to have this direct connection with your audience. You build up this fan base that way, it's easy to tell them when a new book is coming out. Uh, it's also good to have for blog drips, for example, that's when somebody signs up for your email list and then you automatically send them an email such as, thanks for signing up for my list, here's a free audiobook guide. So. <coughs> When you're doing marketing, it's important to do research and uh, figure out what interests your readers. What is it about your book that stands out and made you want to write it? And then who else has that kind of interest? And then you can search for people and reach out. This can be both offline and online. It can be authors. It can be um, anyone in different industries who just kind of share that interest. I also like to collect data. Surveys are a great way. My favorite example of a survey is Jim Bianco's album, Cookie Cutter. This was a few years ago. All 17 songs on the album were inspired by fans who filled out the 69 questions survey. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. Uh, there's different survey tools you can use. You can use surveys for a lot of different ways. You can ask, like, hey, what do you think of this cover? What do you think of this title? You can ask, or figure out some demographic information about your audience so that you can your marketing around that. Book tours. This is a great way to get book reviews, get your book out there, people tweeting about it, all kinds of things. This is a short list. I have more in the appendix places you can start. Some advice. Um, I blog, I review self published ebooks. So, as a blogger, please read submission guidelines carefully and also really appreciate it if you personalize the emails, take the time to figure out the blogger's name. Uh, <laughs> it's, there's so many, I, I have my name all over the contact areas and yet some people still have no idea who I am. Anyway, also always submit to blogs that cover your book's genre. This is because sometimes 
your book might be really good, but it's not that person's cup of tea. So then they thought, eh, this is one star. I don't like this genre. So avoid that. If it seems too daunting to, oh, yes. Are you saying you're submitting your book to other bloggers? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Reaching out, um, yeah, these directories, they have links to, uh, the directories often categorize bloggers by the genre that they are interested in. So they charge? No, these are free. Free directories online. And you're submitting your whole, um, your whole manuscript, or you're submitting an excerpt, or you're submitting submit your title? For me, I submit a review copy. Depending on the submission guidelines, though, sometimes they say, query us first. Let me know if I'm interested, if I have time. Sometimes they say, just send the file right away. So it just depends. You have to do a little research. If it seems too daunting to reach out one by one, and it can be, it can be really time consuming, there are these book tour packages that you can book online now. It's <coughs> a short list. Either way, it's a good idea to have a media kit so that you can easily and quickly share information should someone request it. So, author bio, book description, cover image, things like that. So I know pretty much everyone is on social media, but I'm just going to go over a few of the basics. Uh, Twitter is obviously a very large platform. What I really like about Twitter are the hashtags, and you may have seen this hashtag and writing, for example, is when writers who are working on manuscripts, they use this hashtag and you know what they're doing. I also really like uh, participating in chats. For example, Kate Chat, which is run by a woman named Kate Tilton, who works with authors. Every Thursday from 6 to 7 p.m., she has this Kate Chat. Um, usually she has a guest, somebody from the industry, who will answer people's questions, and they'll have a specific topic. Contest. This one, sorry, I just I recently learned about this one, Pitnat. The last one happened in September. I think they do this three or four times a year. And if you use this hashtag um, on a certain day of the year, literary agents are just watching Twitter for this hashtag and looking for Twitter pitches of books. So if you do this and they like your pitch, they'll like it, retweet it, something. Sometimes this can be to a deal. Um, some interesting things also, Twitter now, some people are using them for Twitter novels. Like Philip Pullman wrote Jeffrey the Housefly, and that's pretty cool, doing 140 characters at a time. <laughs> this is an example of a one of my favorite indie authors, Ron Flick. As you can see, he's doing well on Twitter. He has over 14,000 followers. He has a number of series. Um, this main cover one is his series for uh, Alice from Alice in Wonderland, who is a part of the Wizard of Oz world. It's pretty interesting. And he often promotes his books on Twitter, or um, asks people for opinions, things. He gets a lot of engagement on this platform. <coughs> Facebook. Uh, we use this for Anodino, and what I really like about Facebook is that we can see how engaged people are, the insights, how many people saw this post, how many are talking about it. Pretty exciting. Goodreads, of course. This one is kind of a must for book lovers, book readers, and writers. What I like about Goodreads is the giveaways. But one thing to keep in mind about Goodreads giveaways is they have to be physical books, so um, that will affect what countries you're willing to ship out to and how many books you want to give away for your shipping costs. Here's an author who's done really well on Goodreads. His name is Pedro Barento. He wrote The Prince of the Singularity, which has a lot of religious overtones. So he knew he had to find the right audience. Like, and not everyone's going to be receptive to his book. So he did a lot of research. Um, I think over a couple of years, he only let a certain group of people who he knew would be interested in his book read and review his book. And as you can see, he's done pretty well. 213 ratings, nearly four stars. It's pretty good. Uh, Goodreads isn't the only place you can do giveaways. There's a library thing, which is awesome. You can do ebooks. I think up to 100 books at a time. Also, Rafflecopter. Rafflecopter, <coughs> you can give away anything online. And the way people enter is by tweeting or sharing on social media a number of different ways. So it's a good way to uh, spread the word about your book. Tumblr. This is a blogging platform. Here's a good success story. Tim Manley, um, he was a teacher in New York. And in his free time, did this fairy tales for 20-somethings. He drew these comics of the uh, fairy tale characters in urban settings. And it got so popular, Penguin ended up publishing it in 2013 as Alice in Tumblrland. And it's really entertaining if you get a chance to look through it. Recommend. 
Google Plus, uh, we use this a lot for I Know Dino because of the communities in particular. There turns out a lot of other adult dinosaur enthusiasts, I stress the word adult, uh, <laughs> who are on these really active communities. <laughs> and we have met some amazing people this way that we've ended up actually interviewing for our podcast. Uh, a number of paleo artists and people who have their own dinosaur websites. YouTube, this is great. You can, if you're doing well on YouTube, you kind of get higher rankings in Google. There's a lot of different ways that you can use YouTube. You can, for example, have a couple of actors or friends play out scenes from your book, in addition to book trailers. Or if you're doing nonfiction, you can explain some of the concepts in your book. Um, as an example of someone doing really well on YouTube, this is a little bit indirect. Crash Course. That's John Green and his brother, John Green of The Fault in Our Stars and other YA books. They started this crash course platform, which is educational videos that actually a lot of teachers use. Um, and they built up this huge following that I think it helped spill over a little bit into uh, John Green's writing platform, Help 360. Pinterest. Pinterest is great because it's image heavy, so it's great for cover reveals. Also, uh, you can now do these privacy settings, so you can set your boards only so certain people can see them. And this is great if you're, say, fleshing out a character and you want to get some feedback before you let other people know. One example of a Pinterest board I really like, this is uh, Kate Chilton's Authors and Readers. We've got over 2,000 followers, there's a bunch of people who are part of this, and it's really great because they post uh, quotes that they like or covers of books that they're reading, and it's just it's really a great community. LinkedIn, this one you might think of as more for your resume and professional, but there are a number of groups, and I have more in the appendix, of authors or people in publishing. This is a great way to connect and talk about it or ask people questions or advice, things like that. There's a whole bunch of other strategies you can do. So for example, pre-orders, talked about that a little bit. One good thing about pre-orders for iBooks and Kobo in particular is that any uh, pre-order sales that you have accumulate account towards your day one of launch sales, so you could potentially shoot up bestseller lists. Uh, sneak peeks, this is what Apple does for their special section for pre-orders. You can uh, set up pre-orders on Smashwords too, up to 12 months in advance, and I recommend having a strong marketing campaign. That means the few weeks leading up especially have contests and chapter reveals. You can acknowledge beta readers. You can also set a special pre-order price that's a little bit lower than launch day, for example. And speaking of price, it's good to experiment with price. According to Smashwords, $3.99 right now is the sweet spot for full-length fiction novels. This is ebooks. You can go a little bit higher for nonfiction, but it's good to play around with and see what people respond to. Also, the timing of when you launch your book. Uh, larger publishers tend to launch on Tuesdays, so maybe you don't want to compete with that. Maybe launch on a weekend, because it turns out that more people buy ebooks on Saturdays and Sundays. It's a good idea to have a backlist. Uh, the more books that you have, the more marketing strategies you can play around with. Uh, series are great, because if you hook a reader in book one, they're going to hopefully follow you through the whole series. <coughs> Remember though that ebooks are long tail, so for as an example, The Rabbit Who Wants to Fall Asleep, this was a huge deal over the summer. This author was five years in the making, it was his third book, and what he did is he sold it at seminars and classes and got a lot of word of mouth. Then he asked friends and friends of friends to translate into six different languages, and this led to more word of mouth and actually sales in the Amazon UK uh, list. He got the bestseller list and they took notice and they said, let's connect you with some media outlets like The Guardian. And that led to uh, bestseller lists in the U.S. and other countries. And that led to him getting a literary agent and a seven-figure deal with Penguin Random House. Permafree, this is another good technique. Uh, you can attract new readers this way. This works really well for series or if you just have multiple books that uh, people can uh, can get if they like it so much they want to buy your next book. So an example of an author doing well with permafree is Susan K. Quinn. She uh, does a couple, Open Minds, which is the first in her Mind Jack trilogy, and Delirium, which is part of her Debt Collector series, which was a serial she did. 
fact matter, this one's really easy to add into your ebook, something as simple as an author bio. So for ebooks, you don't have to worry about your uh, back page, like the book synopsis and everything. You can have other stuff, um, such as live links to where people can buy your books online. If you're doing pre-orders, it's a good idea to have a pre-order link. Also links to where you are on social media or your blog, where people can connect with you online. Coupon codes, this is a, a good one. Uh, Smashwords lets you do coupon codes for your books. Uh, iBooks lets you do 250 coupon codes per book. This is when you give a coupon code and say, hey, here's my book for free. And a good strategy is to offer it to somebody you would like to review your book and say, here's a, here's a free copy in exchange. Please give an honest review. Google Alerts, this is good to set up for uh, your niche. A lot of dinosaur moves this way. Also about you. <laughs> If somebody's talking about you or something you're interested in, you know about it and you can jump into those conversations. There's also offline marketing strategies. I really like what Hugh Howie did, who was a really cool guy actually. I got to interview him for an article a few years ago. And Wool, of course, big success. He uh, did these custom flash drives, these fallout shells for ones here, and he offered I believe 10 on Rapplecopter. He got 24,000 entries. People want, really wanted these custom flash drives. Uh, fringe Festival, this is an interesting one. This author, Randy Ross, decided to turn some of the scenes from his novel into a play, and then he <coughs> submitted it to a local Fringe Festival and got a lot of word of mouth that way. You can also do uh, business cards with book covers or stickers, and I have some of my own with me, also in the bookstore if you want to check them out. Um, cool thing about our stickers, actually our I Know Dino logo, this is an example of connecting with people. Uh, I worked with an indie author who, I'll um, talk about him a little more in a moment, um, Matt Pike, really great writer, really great guy. Uh, worked with him for a number of different self-publishing things, and it turns out, and he, he's in Australia, so we've never met face-to-face, -face, at least yet. And it turns out he is a graphic designer by day, and he was so happy that I helped him with some of his self-publishing things. When I told him we were doing a dinosaur podcast, he was like, let me make, like, make your logo for you for free, which was awesome. Um, of course, there's other things like book festivals and readings. You can also learn a lot from games. It's surprising how much indie authors and indie game developers have in common. There's a lot of overlap in terms of marketing strategies, things like that. Just a couple of examples. Um, so for this novel, Shadow Curse, this author wrote a companion game to go with his novella. Um, and then here is Matt Pike, I just mentioned. This is one of his series. He has three series out. Uh, his Zombie Rising series, which is for middle grade. And this one's really great um, because he made these special download collectibles that you can collect the further you get into the series. So the more you read, the more of these extra uh, digital stickers that you get. Um, so uh, of course, it doesn't your marketing strategies don't have to be just focused on uh, books. You can also do podcasts or online courses. Uh, audiobooks, which we talked about, and serialization, this one's an interesting one. The Pigeonhole, this, they're a new UK startup. I believe that they're accepting submissions, and what they do is, uh, they call them staves, because they're very influenced by Charles Dickens. They'll, uh, they'll release a few chapters for one stave every week, and then you kind of build up an audience that way. Um, Wattpad, this is another way you could do potentially serialization, but Wattpad, you, it's completely free, so you don't get paid for any of that. But you, if you do gather enough readers, because it tells you a lot of interesting analytics about who's reading your book or how many people are reading your book, that could potentially lead to a publishing deal. It's happened in a couple of cases. Merchandising um, is another option. Also, box sets. Box sets can be maybe if you have a series and you want to put it together as one big set and then sell it for a discount. You can also work with other authors in your genre and do cross promotion that way. So being an indie author now means more than just writing and publishing. It's being an authorpreneur. It's building a business, connecting with people, getting funding. This, this helps so much. And a lot of times funding means crowdfunding. So if you're doing crowdfunding, you're going to want a strategy. You're going to want to make a little intro video about yourself, what you're doing, goals that you're trying to reach, and rewards that you're going to give people in exchange. Um, here's an example of what we do for I Know Dino. We recently launched a platform called Patreon. And Patreon is a little bit different from, say, Kickstarter. And Kickstarter has an end date in mind. You have 30 days, however many days. 
Patreon is ongoing for month. So the people who are pledging to us are pledging a certain amount that they're going to give us every month just because they want to see our work ongoing. This works well for uh, ongoing projects like podcasts or serial novels, things like that. One success story I want to mention, this one's great, it's Robin Snow writes a book, and he did this on Kickstarter back in 2009. He wrote a novella during his Kickstarter campaign. He was able to do that partially because he actually met his funding goal by the end of week one, which I think took off a little bit of the pressure. But he was able to amass much more than his funding goal, and I think it's because of his interesting backer updates. So for example, he did a Google AdWords campaign to figure out what if, um, his protagonist's name would be, and then he shared the results with his backers, although not the name, he did a name reveal later. He also did a short story challenge where he said, all right guys, if we can make it to the $10,000 mark by midnight of this day, I'm gonna get on a plane the next day, fly from San Francisco to New York, and during that time, I'm going to write, edit, make a cover, and publish a short story for you. <laughs> and he did it. It's, it's, yeah, insane, but he did it. <laughs> So, as a result, he got nearly $14,000 pledge, 398% of his goal, and then eventually FSG bought rights to his book in 2011, and they published it. It's called Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore, and if you have a chance, if you've heard of it, or if you get a chance to read it, I recommend it. It's really entertaining. <coughs> so, connecting. Um, it's important. Sometimes writing, the writing life can be a lonely one, so you want to connect with other people. And there are a lot of different uh, places online. I have more in the appendix. One I want to point out, though, is Meetup. Meetup's great because you can find local people in your area. So for example, in the Bay Area, we have this big group called Shut Up and Write. And you meet once a week. Actually, they have for different people's schedules, different times a week in different areas. And you just go meet at coffee shops. Same place every time you move so you get to know people. Conferences are also great. Uh, there are also some online, such as Indie Recon. And I have you know, links in the this. <coughs> There's, uh, in addition to crowdfunding, some other places you can get funding. There's different contests you can enter, also fellowships and grants for writers. One thing to keep in mind, though, publishing is always changing, so be aware of new developments. Um, you know, subscribe to my blog. I'll let you know. But also some examples uh, of some sh recent changes. Kindle Unlimited <coughs> recently switched to a pay-per-page model. That means before, um, a couple months ago, it used to be if somebody read 10% of your book, you got paid a certain amount. And now it's uh, based on how many pages somebody re reads, you get paid a certain amount. Uh, there's also this great site, um, well, company called BookTrack. Now you can add soundtracks to your books, which can add another level of engagement. Mm -hmm. So, thank you so much. I hope you something. And if you want to contact me, here's my information.